Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of God is Not a Theory with Ken Fish. I'm your host, Grant Pemberton, and we're having another episode today of Bible Studies with Ken Fish. We've talked about this before, about how Ken reads the scriptures, how does he deal with the text, and today we're answering a reader's question with uh, the Bible, just in general. Is it reliable? And if so, how should we read it? What version should we read? All of those wonderful things in between. So, Ken, thank you for joining us. We're trying to, uh, in case you're wondering if you're watching and you're noticing that our outfits are very similar to weeks prior, it's because we're, we're trying to record a few episodes before you're off to Australia. Before we get into that, Ken... What are you getting ready to do in Australia? Uh, we're going to be holding meetings in the Brisbane area, uh, Byron Bay, which is northern New South Wales. Uh, we'll go down to Sydney and be with an ecumenical community, which is both Catholic and Protestant. They're practicing their respective versions of Christianity communally. Uh, they live um, in in the same neighborhoods and often as literally neighbors, they bought a whole blocks of homes so they can uh, carry out their lives in community with one another. And then uh, and then we will also be with another church in the Sydney area known as Greater Gospel Life Coalition uh, before we return for a final series of meetings uh, with the Vineyard Movement in, uh, in Australia. That's awesome. And it's going to be several weeks. Is that right? Yeah, about a three-week trip. Great. So, listener, every blooming onion that you eat at Outback Steakhouse will go to a portion of that will go to help uh, Ken's ministry in Australia. I'm just kidding, but enjoy your blooming onions uh, in the meantime, and maybe maybe say a prayer for Ken uh, and uh, and the churches as they're over there. So let's, uh, without further ado, Ken. First of all, the scriptures. Can we trust them? Yeah, uh, yes, we can. There's there's the short answer, and if you heard nothing else, you can move on. But we're actually doing this podcast, Grant, because uh, someone wrote in and said, could you please address the topic of Scripture and its reliability? And so um, that's exactly what I'm hoping to do, and I'm just turning in my small Bible, not my big one that I often use, um, I'm turning to my small Bible. This is what Paul the Apostle has to say about the scriptures. And remember, of course, that Paul was a Jewish rabbi. And so much of his thinking reflects the, the, the sentiments of the rabbinical community in the first century uh, of, of, of this time, it's the first century AD. Nowadays, scholars tend to say the common era, but that's because they're trying to move away from language about Jesus. Um, I'm not trying to do that. So the first century AD. But um, Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says to him, uh, no, I'm in the wrong chapter. There we go. I was thinking, wait a minute, this doesn't even look right. Um, Paul says to Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 3.14 and following, he says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, meaning me. Because in the book of Acts, it tells us that Paul led Timothy to Christ. So, all right, that's where he learned what he uh, what he believed. But it's interesting, Paul is admonishing Timothy this way, because at this time, Timothy is a leader in the church. Um, he trained under Paul, but he later becomes the leader of the church, the congregation in Ephesus. And some scholars think that, you know, by the time Timothy is leading this congregation, the citywide church in Ephesus was at least 50,000 strong. So this is a major sort of a mega church type thing, but it's mostly existing as small groups that are interconnected. Because remember, at this time, church buildings don't really exist. They might meet in synagogues, but a, <clears throat> a synagogue that would seat 50,000 people would be a very unusual thing in a, in a pagan city like Ephesus. Um, so Paul says that he should continue in what he had learned and had firmly believed, and I think this is important, actually, because uh, Timothy, of all people, should have believed. He'd been a co traveling companion of Paul's. He'd seen the miracles and the signs and wonders. He'd been there for some of the you know great events that we record in Scripture and teach on, and yet Timothy at times seemed to have been a bit timid. And so Paul had to tell him, 
on more than one occasion that, you know, he should be strong. He should be bold. He should do the work of an evangelist. There was something about Timothy that he, he kind of wanted to draw back a little bit later in life. And I think that might have relevance for, you know, many modern Christians who find that maybe the zeal of youth has worn off. And then he says, uh, knowing from whom you learned it, verse 15, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings. Well, sacred writings are the scriptures. And remember, Timothy had had a mother who was a Jewess. And we know this from the book of Acts. And he also had a believing grandmother. And the two of them, mom and grandma, had taught him the ways of the Lord from the book. And one of the things that we know uniquely about the Jewish community and later the Christians is they were always called people of the book. Now, Christians also were people of the spirit. And, you know, Paul advocates for the spirit um, openly in many different places, uh, particularly in Galatians and in Romans 8.14. He famously says, all those who are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God or sons and daughters of God. So Paul is definitely a man of the spirit. We have the whole book of 1 Corinthians talking about what to do with the administration of spiritual things. And yet Paul brings Timothy back, not to that, but rather to the things of the scripture. So from childhood, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. So you've been learning these since you were a boy, just a little boy. Um, and they are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So there's a there's a strengthening and an enriching of our faith that comes with the, the written word of God. All scripture is, is theopanoustos, is the Greek word, is breathed out by God. Theo for God, panoustos, to breathe. So all scripture is breathed out by God. It is literally the very breath of God captured and inscripturated, meaning written on the page, in order that it would not be lost and that we could read it. And if it's breathed out by God, everything God does is good and true. Sin corrupts things in the world, but anything God does is good and true. Well, and so Paul says, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching and reproof and correction and for training in righteousness in order that the man of God, or we could say also the woman of God, may be complete, equipped for every good work. So the, there seems to be a clear implication, I'd say more than an implication, a clear statement by Paul that the scripture itself is perfect, that it is uh, trustworthy, and it is the very thing that we should center our thinking on. In some ways, this is similar to what the Lord speaks to Joshua when when Moses has died and Joshua is now taking over as the leader of the nation. And the Lord says to, uh, to Joshua in Joshua 1.8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So we'll prosper and be in success in whatever we are pursuing. Presumably, these are righteous pursuits. If we live according to the word of God. And that's from Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. So what Paul is saying to Timothy is analogous to and parallel to what, what, it, says in, uh, what it says in the book of Joshua. Well, in... So staying here with this, with Paul and his rabbinical roots and his advice to Timothy in the letter that he's writing to Timothy, um, what do we say about the breadth of the New Testament? I think it's fair to say that Paul is probably talking about what we consider to be the Old Testament. Right. Is he also talking about... Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, the, his letters. I mean, you know, what what do you think Paul is saying about the New Testament books? I think Paul is saying this about the New Testament books. Um, in the second letter of Peter, uh, you know, Paul and Peter had some disagreements and tension between them. Uh, this is recorded in Scripture. Paul says in Galatians, when 
Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and would no longer associate with them. So I said to him in front of them all, you are a Jew and you live like a Jew, and yet you associate with Gentiles. Why is it then that when these Jews come, you no longer associate with Gentiles? Well, that's calling somebody out. I don't care if it's the first century or the 21st. Um, and so they, they had that tension at least. Uh, there may have been some other matters as well. And yet in Second Peter, uh, Peter says that sometimes the scriptures can be a little difficult to understand. And he says, um, this is true even of the writings of Paul, as with the other scriptures. Peter says that. Mm. So the New Testament actually makes a claim there of itself. And Paul wrote half the New Testament. There's a claim there. For the reliability, the inspiration, the integrity of the scriptures. But, you know, one of the things that was right. embedded in this query from one of our listeners um, was, well, how do we know that what has come to us is reliable? How do we know that the transmission of the scriptures is, in fact, intact? So um, there's a book that everybody listening to this podcast might want to get. It's not particularly long. Um, and it's called The New Testament Documents, Are They Reliable? The New Testament Documents, Are They Reliable? The New Testament Documents, Are They Reliable? This book's a little bit dated, but no one's done anything better than it that I'm aware of uh, since it was written. And the man who wrote it was none other than F.F. F. Bruce. And he was the Rylands Professor of Scriptural uh, Criticism, as they call it, at the University of Manchester in England. And F.F. F. Bruce does a masterful job of articulating far more than we're going to be able to do on this podcast. But he talks about the chain of transmission as we go from the original documents. You know, Paul wrote a letter or Mark wrote a gospel. The chain of transmission from that original document to what we now have today. And the number may have gone up, but the last number I have in my head, I probably should have checked it before we started recording. But anyway... The number I have in my head is that there are more than 31,000 manuscripts of the New Testament or portions of it. And the thing that's interesting is there's a greater than 99% congruence among all of them. And of the 1% that isn't fully congruent, it's, it's the kind of thing where if we said an apple or a apple, well, we know grammatically in English, an apple is correct. But sometimes people don't know that, and they may, they may write it incorrectly. So there, there are some letters that change, but they don't actually change the meaning of the text. And beyond that, if you look at whatever variances exist uh, between these various manuscripts, there is not a single doctrine of Christianity that rests on these verses that is in question because of a seeming variance or discrepancy among the texts. So this leads us to the question, well, how did these variances come about? Let's assume for a moment that we have an original uh, manuscript of the Bible. So we'll say the Gospel of Mark. And just to make the, the argument simple, we're going to say that there are three copies of it that get made. And then from those three, many more copies come about. Each one might be copied many, many times. Now, there was an entire uh, method that the Jews used for copying manuscripts. And admittedly, some of the early congregations in the church were Gentile, not Jewish. But let's just say this. I don't think modern uh, critics of the scripture appreciate the, the lengths to which ancient societies as a whole went in order to assure that when they made a version of a, of a former scroll or something, that it was absolutely perfect. So um, we've got these three, in, the, in our example, three manuscripts, which would in turn be copied on more and more and would become part of a manuscript tradition. And so one of the things that, uh, one of the principles that scholars use is the oldest manuscripts are presumed to be the most accurate manuscripts. So if we talk about these three originals that come from the, the very first version of Mark, presumably they would be viewed as the most reliable when we date them and understand that 
they are the oldest. All right, so we've got these three copies of the original version of Mark. And, um, and you know, there will be copies made from those three. And however many that ultimately turns into. Copies get made of copies, get made of copies. But what people don't really understand, and Bruce goes through this in his uh, in his book, is that there was an entire process for verifying. So when they finished a copy, they would literally go through and count all the letters to be sure they had the right number of letters. And then they would they would read through the original and the copy side by side to make sure they read the same way. Now, yeah, your eye can make a mistake, but they usually had at least two people do that. So they they were double checking it. The other thing they they would do is they would read backward because that was that's not something where your eye falls into the rut of all that you know. And they would look up and down the columns to be sure that everything was orthogonal, that what it was on one, it was on the other. And so this was this was all part of their process for verifying that they had a true and valid copy. And if they didn't have a good one, they would either amend it so it now read correctly, if that was possible, or they would destroy it and start over. So the purpose was actually to verify that they had good, clean copies. And this is actually why the entire manuscript evidence that we have, more than 31,000 of them, is is more than 99% consistent across all of the various translations. Now, occasionally a scribe would slip and do something he shouldn't have done. And they, in this case, they were all men. Uh, and he would, he would put in what was known as a gloss. He would put in a clarifying remark because it somehow made the, the passage seem clearer. All right, now let's go back to our three manuscripts of Mark. So we, we made these copies and now uh, a flood comes, a fire comes, there's an invasion, the monastery gets burned, whatever it is, okay. Bunches of manuscripts perish. And let's assume in our example that one of the three originals is one of those that perishes, but a bunch of the downstream manuscripts made from that one that perished survive. If they are true and authentic manuscripts of that original, they are not less valid than the original. They are simply newer. One of our principles is older manuscripts are generally deemed to be more reliable, generally. But if we have what we call a clean manuscript tradition, we may be just fine. Now let's take one of our other uh, streams and let's say... Uh, somebody decided that they wanted a clarifying word. They wanted to gloss something and they put it in and a subsequent copier either didn't quite catch that or thought they liked the gloss so much that they incorporated the gloss into their translation. And now you have a mild variation between what was the original and what is now the, the newest and greatest version. It's not inconsistent with what it said. It's simply a clarification of what it said in the mind of that person who did the translation at that time. It's not the best translation you could have, but neither is it doing violence to the scripture in the sense that it's at least trying to capture the proper sense of it. So we've got our third tradition where there were no such changes at all. There was no fire, no Viking raiders, nothing like that. Um, now we come down to the manuscripts, let's say five layers down from those original three copies. So these would be like the great, great grandchildren of the original version of Mark in this, in this example I've laid out. Which one is the most reliable? Well, the one that had no changes at all for sure is reliable. The one that had the older versions perish in war or flood, it's still reliable. And the one that uh, had the, the gloss put in it, it's not as reliable, but it's mostly reliable. But now let's go down five more generations and what happens? Let's say that all of the generations from those three original copies, Gen 1, in the first and the third groupings, something happens to them. Big fire, Viking raids, floods, whatever. And all we have is the 10th generation manuscript. Okay. Are they still accurate? As long as nothing's changed, those 10th generation manuscripts are still accurate. Let's go to our, num our, our middle one that we said there was a gloss made and it got copied five generations worth. And now we have our 10th generation manuscript, but it didn't have everything perish. 
from generation one all the way down to generation nine, it's still there. So when we go back to that one that had the gloss in generation four, that's now the oldest manuscript that we have. And it's got a gloss in it. Is it more accurate than the generation 10 manuscripts of, of the first and third manuscript traditions? No, it's not, even though it's older. So the idea that something is generally deemed to be more reliable if it's older doesn't mean that it's always more reliable. It's just that's the starting assumption. And one of the things that scholars also do is they'll compare all the various versions of something. And so if they have, remember, I said we got 31,000 fragments, whole manuscripts, everything. So if out of 31,000, 30,000 of them read identically, maybe 30,800 read identically, and 200 of them have the gloss, which one do you think is likely to be accepted as the correct version? The one that has the most witnesses. And so this is kind of how we think about textual criticism and why it's not always true that the oldest version is the most reliable. And so when we come to something like Mark 16 that says the two oldest manuscripts of Mark do not contain the language about uh, these signs shall accompany those who believe in my name, they shall cast out demons, uh, etc. When we come to that in Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 16, or 9 through 20, excuse me, 9 through 20, when we come to that, I don't think the fact that the two oldest manuscripts we have omit that means that it wasn't there. I think it means that they're not there in the two oldest manuscripts because the, the, the consensus plenty or of all the other manuscripts is that it should be in there. And so when people ask, is the, has the New Testament been transmitted reliably? Yes, it has. And now I'm going to switch channels just slightly, and I want to talk about the Old Testament. Uh, going back to 2017, in that year, the Israeli Antiquities Authority took a scroll that they had found at Qumran that had been badly burned and had been lying in a jar for 20 centuries since the scrolls were hidden. <clears throat> and when it had been discovered in, uh, when was Qumran discovered? 1947 or 8, I don't remember the year, one or the other. Uh, when Qumran, when that was discovered, and they took the scrolls out of the cave. This was one of those scrolls. And they knew it was too fragile to do anything with. So rather than attempting to unroll it or decode it or anything else, they, they stored it in dry nitrogen so that it would be no degradation. And they put it in the museum, uh, the, Isra the Israel Museum, you know, below grade, solid bunkers, everything like that. And everybody knew about this scroll that had been in existence for all this time and nobody dared touch the thing. Well, between those years and the current period, um, a new technology came into being known as computerized tomography or CT scanning. We use it to section the human body and look inside the human body without having to cut the body open. And so somebody came up with the idea, why don't we do a CT scan on this scroll? And with it, they could take it without touching it, without opening it. They could run a CT scan on it, and they could digitally unroll the scroll and see all of the characters are there, even though the scroll was burned, because the ink is a little different from the burned vellum. And with that, they can make out the characters. And so they literally deciphered the entire scroll. And you know what they found? They found the book of Leviticus. Mm -hmm. Well, that scroll predated Jesus by 200 years. Wow. And the next nearest scroll to that one that they had of Leviticus was found in a version of the Torah that had come from a synagogue uh, in Turkey. And it was, it was translated in the, year, in, the, in the 10th century, so the 900s. So there's 1,100 years gap between the burn squirrel found in Qumran in 1947 or 8. Again, I don't remember the year now, but it was one or the other. And this scroll, which is known as the Aleppo Codex. 1,100 years had passed, and when they uh, compared the text of Leviticus from the with the Aleppo Codex text of Leviticus, guess what they found? Not a single letter varied. Wow. Literally 
perfect transmission across 1,100 years. Wars, floods, the destruction of Jerusalem. And again, there's a whole manuscript tradition behind the Aleppo Codex, but it shows you how careful the scribes were. It shows you the scholarly uh, tradition that undergirds those, those manuscripts, which have come down to us, upon which we base translations like this. Sure. And so when people say the scripture's been corrupted, the scripture's been perverted, we can't trust it, we don't know what it originally said, yes, we can. Because people had reverence for the written word of God in those times, and that's going right back to what I, the language I read out of Paul, that all scripture is God-breathed, therefore we treat it with reverence, and we cling to every, every micro-breath, every that comes out of the mouth of God, because in this we understand the ways and the mind of God. This is a kind of reverence and holiness for the scriptures that frankly doesn't exist in modern America today. No, that's good. That's great. And well, then, I think it's, oh, yeah, go yeah. ahead. No, go on. No, go ahead. Okay, so then uh, when you start talking about rendering the scripture across languages, so we're moving out of Hebrew and Greek and a little bit of Aramaic, into modern translations. The King James Bible was a very good Bible for its time. It was translated in 1611. Um, it used a committee of 70 scholars who were very good in Greek and Latin, Greek, Latin, Hebrew, and Aramaic. Most of them taught at Oxford and Cambridge. There are a few editorial things done there to reflect the sentiments that none other than King James I, thus the name King James Version, uh, King James I had authorized that translation, and they seem to indicate maybe a little more def <clears throat> deference to uh, secular power. But but beyond that, it, it used the best manuscripts of the day. But guess what? In the 411 years since the trans, or 410 years, I guess, 2021 to 1611, yeah, 410 years since the translation of the King James Bible, um, there have been additional manuscripts discovered, including those at Qumran and those at St. Catherine's Monastery, uh, including Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Alexandrinus, which go all the way back to the third century. That's the 200s AD. Um, so all these things didn't, they, the, the King James translators didn't know about them. They were just relying on the manuscripts they had. And so, um, so they incorporate all that new information into these modern translations of the Bible. And again, no doctrines have changed. There's a few places where they say, well, the earliest manuscripts don't have these verses like Mark 16, 9 to 20. We're not, they're, they're not thereby saying you shouldn't pay attention to them or read them at all. Some might draw that conclusion and some would even go there, admittedly. But that's not what that's meant to say. It's just to say, we know that there is some controversy about these verses because they talk about speaking in tongues and driving out demons and drinking poison and picking up snakes and you know the lord jesus continuing to work alongside of those disciples when they went out and proclaimed the everlasting gospel of salvation and so with all of that they're like we know that like what it says and what you experience aren't the same so they they make that footnote and you can draw your own conclusions but if you followed what i was explaining with our three hypothetical uh, branches of tradition coming out of the very first original gospel of Mark, if you followed that, then you would understand that the fact that uh, the oldest don't contain it doesn't mean that the oldest didn't contain it. And then we, um, and then we come to, okay, so which translations of the Bible should we be reading? And I've said it many times in many different forums, but um, if you're going to read the Bible in English today, you should probably be reading one of the following, ESV, English Standard Version, ESV, English Standard Version. This is a version that's accepted across the English-speaking world, whether in England or India or the United States or anywhere else. So the ESV is a good translation. Uh, the new King James Version is a good translation because it incorporates all that latest learning from modern manuscript analysis and study and keeps much of the same flow and feel of the King James Bible. So the NKJV is a good translation, New King James Version. I don't usually recommend the King James for the simple reason that the language of it is Elizabethan English. It's the language of William Shakespeare. And most people aren't good enough at reading that style of English anymore 
There was a time when we taught that stuff in schools, but we don't do it now because Shakespeare was a dead white male. And in our world in which, you know, we're trying to be more diverse in what we, uh, you know, what we teach um, English speaking students, because he's a dead white male, he's kind of off the list. So we don't really teach Shakespeare as we did when I was a kid and maybe when you were a kid, Grant. But I remember studying Shakespeare in uh, 12th grade English and, you know, having to read a number of his plays. And that style of English is not readily understood by most people today. So I don't recommend the King James for that reason. But the new King James is much more readable because all the these, thys, and thous have been taken out. And there's one verse out of Job in the King James that reads, is there flavor in the slime of a purslane? Well, mo nobody knows what the slime of a purslane is. But in you, if you look at a new King James or you look at an ESV, that verse reads, is there flavor in the white of an egg? Well, I can understand what that means, but I don't know about the slime of a purslane. Now, if you, you know how to use a dictionary, you could probably get there, but uh, but most people aren't going to stop and pull out a dictionary to, while they're reading their Bible. And then the third translation that I recommend is the New American Standard Version, uh, also known as the NASB or New American Standard Bible, has multiple versions. The one you want, if you're going to use it, is the 1995 version, because that's before the time when they decided to take what was a very good very clean translation of the scripture and start modifying it in order to suit the sentiments of modernity. I don't think we should modify the scripture. It's breathed out by God. Everything that God breathes out is perfect. And as I've said before, every letter is inspired. And the reason we say every letter is inspired is Jesus said, not one jot or tittle will pass away. Well, jots and tittles were uh, diacritical marks in the Hebrew text of the Bible um, and the, the modern equivalent would be to dot an I or cross a T or to dot a J. And so Jesus was saying, even the diacritical marks are inspired. So if the, if the dot on an I or a J or the you know crossbar on a T is inspired, well, for sure, the whole letter is inspired. So the very wording, the very, the very elaboration of the words of the Bible, they didn't just come out randomly. The scripture says as men were moved by God as the spirit moved upon them. And with that, they wrote out what the spirit wanted to be inscripturated. Now, that period of time has passed. We don't do that anymore. But if you understand the reverence with which the scriptures were held in, by the ancients, if you understand the process by which they propagated the scriptures in order to preserve intact the integrity of the text, if you understand that we've demonstrated scientifically that the text, in fact, has integrity to the ancient manuscripts, if you understand all of that, then you shouldn't have a great difficulty coming to the idea that, you know, when I pick one of these up, as long as it's been well translated, responsibly translated, I can trust it, I can build my life around it, I can, I can build my house on the rock. There are some other translations which, depending on which one you're talking about, might be somewhat better or somewhat worse. But all of the other ones out there, no matter which one it might be, I have issues with them for one reason or another, because the rendering of the original Hebrew and Greek, which I read um, well, is not always it's not always there where it needs to be in terms of quality. And again, it's because people want to paraphrase things with the I would say generally good objective of trying to make it more understandable or maybe a little more current to the modern period. But I've always said that I think the job of a preacher is to interpret the Bible well. And so this is why in olden times, not even that old, we used to train preachers in biblical languages. I learned Hebrew in seminary. I learned Greek both as an undergrad and in seminary. Um, I've continued to use those languages. And <clears throat> We used to train people in biblical theology. We used to train people in systematic theology. We used to train people in biblical history. We used to train people in biblical theology. We used to train people in, in church history so that somebody who was going to handle the word of God would understand something of how was this understood in the 1600s versus the 1200s so that somebody who was going to preach the word of God could read it if necessary to get behind the English translation into the Hebrew, the Greek, the Aramaic, 
get the sense of it, render it and say, okay, now I'm going to read my very clean English translation, but I'm going to unpack the meaning in the sermon. That's what a preacher is supposed to do. Today, we have many preachers who don't really have those skills. And so they just read it. Many of them don't even own commentaries and they just kind of make it seem to say whatever they want it to say. That's actually not good scholarship. It's actually not good exegesis. And so I really want to encourage people to have confidence in the word of God, the Bible. And I also want to encourage them to, at whatever level they do it, study to show themselves approved, a workman or workwoman uh, who need not be ashamed of the hope that lies within them, that they that having studied, maybe read a few commentaries, understood kind of what other generations and other church leaders have said of these things, they might be able to, uh, as needed, speak about the truths of scripture in a way that is fair and credible and authentic to the wider tradition of Christianity. Now that's, that's great and important. And, uh, you know, just to add to that, um, you know, I've heard people say that uh, you probably shouldn't have a new idea uh, about the scriptures. Um, you know, so if you're, if no one else has thought of what you're thinking of, maybe press pause and go back and do some more digging and do some more research uh, on that. And then the other thing, just to kind of give some uh, practical advice, there is a, a free website called Blue Letter Bible. And you can go and look up the uh, the original language, what uh, what was actually originally written down in the Hebrew and Greek. Uh, if you're so inclined, I encourage folks to do that as a good uh, good starting point. So, um, Ken, again, this is uh, very helpful, and thank you so much uh, for uh, for taking us through this. A lot of people don't know and don't know where to start and uh, don't know don't know what to do. So. Um, Thanks for making it uh, easy and putting the uh, the cookies on the bottom shelf, as they say. My pleasure, Grant. It's always a pleasure. Wonderful. Well, again, I look forward to uh, to many more episodes. With you and I look forward to seeing all of you back here on God's Not a Theory with Ken Fish. recently updated the Orbis Ministries app with Ken's free teaching archive. You can click on the link in the description of this podcast to download today.